to convert our numbers to a complete frequency distribution table, we go through a process. And the first step of that process is identification of the number of classes. What do we do? To the power of k must be greater than n. We find the smallest k that satisfy that condition. Then step one. The next step is that we find the interval and the interval must be greater than or equal to, what was the formula? Remind me. The maximum minus the minimum over K. Very good. And then the third step is that we form our classes based on that interval. And then we do the frequencies. And after that, we go for cumulative frequency, less than cumulative, more than cumulative, relative, and so forth. So, you know, if you are relaxed in your, uh, you know, office, you will follow these steps. This gives you the best uh, form of uh, representation of your data. But if you are in the middle of a conference and somebody is reading a bunch of numbers for you, then your life will not be that relaxed. Uh, and uh, you, know, you have limited time and you want to make sense of that data. You want to know, for example, how many numbers were there and uh, you know, what is the most frequently observed data? What is the minimum? What is the maximum? And so forth. And um, you don't have time. Actually, when he's reading the numbers, you even don't know how many numbers there. Notice that to follow the process, the standard process, we need to know the total number of numbers to find K, right? And so if you don't know K, then basically this classical process doesn't work. In that case, we will use stem and leaf uh, technique, which gives us a frequency distribution table based on a class interval, the fixed class interval of 10, okay? And we don't need to know the number of numbers from the beginning. So you are in the middle of a conference, somebody starts reading the numbers and you follow the example that I'm going to show you. And instead of explaining it for you, you will learn when I'm doing it and then we will do another example. So you'll completely be ready to do that. This stem and leaf, uh, when we go through the process without going through the classical process uh, will give us a lot of information like the minimum maximum the most frequently observed data and so forth yeah yeah so slowly reads the numbers and i will create a stem and leaf frequency table i'm in the middle of a conference go ahead uh 52 52. So I think to myself, okay, if these numbers are in the range of 52, some of them may be 10, 12. So I keep some space for myself. So maybe one class here. Two. So I write my 50 here. And this is the way we create a stem and leaf. I write the rightmost digit on the right side and all of the other digits of the number on the left side. So 52 goes like this. Do you feel that, you know, it's easy. Just write most digits on the right side, the rest on the left side. Read the next number. 43. 43, okay. Three on the right side, four on the left side. 30. 30. Zero on the right side. Three on the left side. 38. 38. Okay. 38. Eight is on the right side. And of course, three is in the left side. So I don't have to repeat that. Uh, any questions? Stop me if you have any questions. Okay. Next. Uh, 30 again. 30. Eight. So 30. Z, uh, uh, I have to erase this eight. Notice that for your exam purposes and for real life purposes, you need a, an eraser. Okay, so uh, 30. Next one. 42. 40. Oh, again, the same problem.
Okay. 12. 12. Okay, so this would be for 20s. So it writes 12 here. Two on the right side, okay. 46. 40, 46 is easy. Four on the left side, six on the right side, okay. 39. Nine on the... Is everybody following me? Okay, 39. Next. Uh, 37. Oh, 37. there's also a 34 and a 32 coming up. Oh, no, no, don't, don't, uh, don't put me under a stress. Okay. Okay. So 37, right? Yes. So I have to erase eight and nine. So seven, eight, nine. Seven, eight, nine. Next. 34. Okay. <laughs> Do you enjoy me suffering? Okay. I warned you. Okay. Four, seven, eight, nine. Okay. There's a 32. He also said yeah, there's that. also a 32 Four, coming up. Seven, eight, nine. Okay. Next 46. number. 46. 46 is easy. Okay. 32. Okay. So two, four, seven, eight, nine. 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 Good. Next. 18. 18. 18. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. Easy. Uh, 41. Seriously? Oh. Okay, 41. One, I don't write the book. Two, one, two, three, six, six. Okay, one, two, three, six, six. One... One, two, three, six, six, okay. And five. Just number five? Just the number five. Okay, zero, five. And that's, that's all of them. So we don't have anything in the range of 20, are you sure? I am positive. Okay, so now this gives us, uh, notice that for this we didn't find K, we didn't find interval. Everything is predetermined. These are our classes and these are the frequencies. And uh, now we can ask, uh, answer a lot of questions. For example, what, is the, what was the minimum number? Five. The smallest number. Very good. What is the maximum number? 52. 52. Very good. What is the class of observations that has the most observations in it? 30. 30. And actually, the class is, notice that the class interval in a stem and leaf chart is always 10. So it is from 30 to under 40. This class has the most uh, uh, observations. And we see that there is a concentration and so forth. So a lot of, like, of course, the process would give me a perfect, uh, you know, information theoretical representation of data. But in the circumstances that I was in the middle of the conference, I'm able to make sense of the data that is read to me as it is read. So I have the minimum, maximum, the most frequently observed. And this stem and leaf, now we are going to the next chapter, chapter three, also easily gives us what is called median. Median is the number where half of the observations are less than it and half of the observations are more than it. And uh, because during the process of a stem and leaf, we have sorted the data, uh, median always need, we, to find the median, we need to sort our numbers. And in a stem and leaf chart, they are always sorted. So now, uh, for example, if the computer gives you, in real life, you punch the numbers in the computer and computer gives you a stem and leaf chart, it's easy to find the median. Um, so median is that number that half of the observations are less than it, half of the observations are more than it. Please take a note. And to find it, uh, we have to find the location. The location of the median is always n plus one divided by two. So, for example, how many observations are in this data set? 16. 
Is this 16? Okay, so if it is 16 numbers, 16 plus one divided by two. 8.5. 8.5. So if I want to find the, the median of this data, I have to find the eighth observation, and then I have to go the, to the midpoint between these numbers. So um, if you have a, um, uh, 16 observations, we, which one is the eighth observation? Let's focus on this. The eighth observation, uh, we, I counted. First observation is five, second is 12, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, eighth observation. So eighth observation is seven, and ninth observation is eight. So the observation 8.5 is between these two, between this one, which is the eighth observation, and this one, which is the ninth observation. So uh, based on this formula, the median is located at 8.5th observation. Just tell me what would be the number between seven and eight, um, right in the middle? 37.5. Very good. So the median based on this formula is 37.5. 5 is our median. And now I claim that half of the observations are less than it, half are more than it. Let's check. How many observations are less than it? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 are less than it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 are more than it. Therefore, 37.5 is our median. Okay, so stem and leaf enables us to understand a lot of things. Notice that we are talking about descriptive statistics. It allows us to find a lot of things about our data without actually going through the formal process. You have to know the formal process, um, but sometimes you need the, also the informal process. No? Okay. So the last thing that is important is the visual presentation of our data which we did to some degree in the previous class. And now we will do it in a complete fashion today. Uh, we will try all different types of presentations that we can have, you know. The data, the classified data can be of two different kinds. Sometimes we have nominal level data. For example, um, I may give you this data, the students location, Burnaby, 10 people live in Burnaby in Surrey. We have 12 people and in North Van, we have 15 people. So if I give you a data like this, we have classified data and, uh, but you know from our first chapter, what is the level of this data? Nominal. Very good, thank you. So this is nominal level data. And for nominal level data, of course we can put them in frequency distribution table. If I want to present such a frequency, I can use what is called a bar chart. So I would say Burnaby, then I would draw a column that is the representation of 10. Uh, for Surrey, I would draw a column that is a little bit taller and it is the representation. Notice that you have to decide like a scale with your ruler. And then for North Van, I would draw a column that is taller proportional and that's the representation of 15. Okay, so on X axis, we show the classes on Y axis, we show the frequency of every class. And now we have a visual representation of our uh, nominal level data. Uh, now, a, a number of questions. Um, does the width, the, does the height of these columns matter? Yes. Yeah, heights must be proportional. So if you choose some height for 10, then 12 and 15 should be proportional to that. Heights matters. Does the width matter? 
No. Yeah. So Burnaby doesn't have a width. So that is optional. These widths, they don't matter. Does the interval, the distance between the columns matter? No. 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 Um, does the order matter? No. This is called a bar chart. A bar chart has, you know, uh, uh, just if you are an honest statistician, you will keep the widths of the columns uh, the same, the heights proportional. If you are a dishonest a statistician, which you, when you go to, to journals and magazines, you will see a lot of dishonest people. I give you an example of a dishonest representation. So they want to say that, for example, those who agree, those who don't agree. They say, agree with something, this is 10. And they want to show the disagree. Of course, the height of disagree, notice that this agree, and then the height should be twice that, and they show disagree like that. They abuse the freedom. Now you think that, oh, look at that. How many, the, the area that this agree is covering is like 10 times the agree, while the real, reality is that they are only twice. So there is actually a book, if you're interested, uh, it's written many years ago, How to Lie with the Statistics. So every time that you um, read a journal or something, notice that people may be interested in, look, not maybe, just I'm telling you for the rest of your life. People are interested in manipulating your mind in every aspect of your life, including using a statistic. So, um, so anyway, but if you want to be honest, uh, in a bar chart, you would um, keep the widths, although it's arbitrarily chosen, you will keep it consistent, you will keep the height proportional and so forth. Now, if we want to draw a bar chart for um, ordinal data, also for ordinal data, <clears throat> we use a bar chart. Notice that in a bar chart for ordinal data, again, the widths, the distances, everything is optional. The only thing that if the data is ordinal, then the order of these columns are not optional. They have to follow the inherent order in the ordinal data. So that is how we create um, a visual representation of nominal and ordinal level data. We can use bar chart. Uh, notice that you can also present the relative frequency. The relative frequency also is valid. Someone can be interested in what proportion of the numbers are in each column. So this would be, what is the total here? Tell me. Um, 37. 37, so actually we can create the relative frequency 10 over 37 and 12 over 37, 15 over 37 is the relative frequency. And if I want to create a bar chart to show the relative frequency, it is possible. But notice that the height of the columns will have the same proportionality. It's just that our reading would be different. Every reading would be um, divided by 37. So you draw the same chart with the same proportions, but then your axis for the, the height of the first column would be not 10, but 10 over 37, right? Okay. Um, we usually don't draw a second chart. What we will do, we will add another column, uh, another uh, axis, Y axis on the right side, and we call that the relative frequency, and we simply show this, uh, what is 10 over 37? Uh, do you have a calculator handy? 10 over 37 would be? <coughs> to seven. And then we just scale, because the height, the proportional height would be the same. It's only the, the value assigned to the column would change. We wouldn't draw a second chart. Uh, so 12 over 37 would be? 30 something, I guess. 32. 32, and this would be? 41. 0.41. So now when you look at this chart, how many bar charts do you see? Uh, 
when you look at this page, how many bar charts do you see? One. No, you see two. We oh, have frequency bar chart, and we have, now depending on which axis you look at, if you look at the columns within the left axis, then you have frequency bar chart. If you look at the same bars and use the right axis, then you have the relative frequency bar chart. Now we have two charts in one diagram. And the other way that we can present ordinal and nominal level data is through a pie chart. Uh, and we divide the pie chart to um, areas that are proportional to the relative frequency. So for example, uh, I can say that, uh, you know, the highest proportion goes to, uh, uh, to North Van, and then a little less proportion goes to, should be less than that, so it should go to like this, to, Surrey, and the smallest proportion goes to Burnaby. And this way, we have another way of representing the relative frequencies in a pie chart. Okay, so um, if we have ordinal and nominal data, we know what to do. Now, if we have a ratio or interval level data, now I'm going to give you a new data set. And please leave enough space on the right side because we have to do a lot of things. I give you classes, like basically you have a bunch of numbers, you know how to put them into classes. Two to the power of K, I, and so forth. So classes are from, let's say, um, five to under 10, 10 to under 15, 15 to under 20, and 20 to under 25. And I give you the frequencies. Uh, we have, uh, one person in the first class, uh, two people in the second class, uh, four people in the third class, and three people in the last class. And uh, now this data is interval because the interval is meaningful. Notice that, let's say, if it is the um, number of the amount of dollar that they have or whatever, it's the ratio data. And if we want to present this, now, because the interval is fixed and it is meaningful, it's an interval of five. It's not like Burnaby. Burnaby doesn't have an interval. But uh, uh, five to 10 has a specific interval. If we want to present this, we have no option. But notice that I give a lot of a space. You have to do the same thing or maybe draw it in a different page of your paper. When we want to present this data, our classes on x-axis must be adjacent. So this is zero. I don't have any classes here. My first class starts at five, then it goes to 10, to 15, to 20 and 25. And notice that you have to use your ruler and keep the these intervals are meaningful and should be the same. Then on y-axis, I'm going to show the frequencies. And when I show the frequencies on y-axis, so this is one for the first class. For the second class is twice that. So this is one, this is two. For the third class, it's something like this. And for the fourth class, it is three. So it's uh, somewhat similar to a bar chart, but it's different than bar chart. If you mistakenly draw a bar chart for this data or a histogram for the other data, 
you will lose mark in the exam. Okay. The, the difference here is this adjacency. Look at this. These columns, these classes are really adjacent. And if you give them some space, you lose mark. Like these, there is no space between these classes. The, we have a bunch of columns that are totally adjacent. And uh, the width is not uh, arbitrarily. You have to choose the width is dictated by the actual interval. The distance between these columns. These columns are equidistance. Like if you get the center of one column and the center of the other column, the distance is five. No matter which column you choose, to the adjacent columns, the center point is equidistance. Um, height is the representation of the frequency. This is called, I write it in black, this is called frequency histogram. So now I want you to complete your, uh, because this is the minimum thing we can do with ratio and int. Notice that with interval and ratio data, the classes will be like this. The distances matter, they have real meaning and so forth. So if you have ratio data, you can also complete this frequency distribution table. To complete the frequency distribution table, what else do we need? We need relative frequency column. We need less than cumulative frequency. What else? Relative less than cumulative frequency. Thank you very much. And then we have... More um, than cumulative frequency and relative more than accumulate frequency. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Okay, so um, I assume that some of you are finished. Please tell me, let's start with the relative frequency. As we go, we will also work on the graphical representation of the data. So relative, so what was the total number of observations in this data set? 10. 10? Okay. So relative frequency for the first class? 0.1. Very good. So now let's go to our chart. If I want to present the relative frequency, of course, the height of these columns would be proportional to one, two, four, three, but each one would be 10 times shorter. So proportionally, they would be the same thing. Is there any way to have less work and draw the relative frequency histogram? Yeah, do it to the right. To the right side of this chart, and we call that relative frequency, and we just scale it the height of the columns would be proportionally the same, but this height would be the representation of 0.1. This height would be the representation of 0.2. This would be the representation of 0.3, and this would be the representation of 0.4. Now, when you look at this chart, this uh, diagram, how many charts do you see? Two. Two. If I use these columns with the... <coughs> Left axis, I have frequency histogram. If I use the same columns with the axis on the right side, then I have relative frequency histogram. So now I have two charts. Good? Now, sometimes you probably have seen it in uh, articles that you have read. People are interested in what is called a line chart. We formally call it a um, polygon, which is another formal name for the line chart. So to convert this to a polygon, we find the midpoint of the columns on the histogram and we connect them. You will use a ruler, so your drawing will be beautiful. 
So this is the a polygon. The only point uh, related to the polygon is that we have to maybe take note. For every polygon, there is a rule, like exceptional rules that you have to remember. For frequency polygon, we have to touch the ground on both sides. So this polygon is now left in the middle of nowhere. You have to touch the ground. And because this classes are equidistant and so forth that we discussed before, this, uh, this must land in the middle of the class before the existing class. So there is a class before this existing class with a width of five, and this must go touch the ground there. And also there is another class on the right side, which will go from 25 to 30. And my, I have to find the midpoint of that, which will be 27.5. And my polygon must land there on both sides to emphasize that there is no observation before five and there is no observation after 25. Do you agree that there is no observation? This time? Yeah, so we want to emphasize that. In a, so this line is called the, maybe I write it here. This is the polygon. And now when you look at this chart, this, this figure, how many charts do you see there? Three. Three charts. I repeat my question. When you look at my screen, how many charts do you see there? Three. Uh, I repeat my question. When you look at this diagram. Four. Yes. I, so if I use this blue polygon with the left axis, I have frequency polygon. And if I use the same polygon with the right axis, the same thing, is the relative frequency polygon. Yes. How many charts do you see on the screen? What are they? The frequency histogram, the relative frequency histogram, the frequency polygon and the relative frequency polygon. Lovely. That's it. Okay. So now let's go to the next step. I want you to uh, maybe uh, tell me the cumulative frequencies, please. Less than cumulative frequencies. Um, so uh, one and three and seven and ten. And relative? Point one, point three, point seven. 1.0. 1. 1. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So now let's try presenting that. Uh, I, I scroll down. So now we want to present the less than cumulative frequency. And notice that less than cumulative frequency, this column is always growing. It actually goes up. So it goes from one to three to seven, never goes down. It's, you know, mathematically, these kind of uh, charts are called monotonic charts. And my classes would be the same, right? So classes are still 5 to 10, 10 to 15, 15 to 20, and 20 to 25. But my y-axis uh, will always grow. And let's start with uh, frequency less than less than cumulative frequency histogram. So how many observations are in the first class? Ladies and gentlemen, I don't see my chart, but you can see that on your paper. What is the height of the first class? One. One? Okay, so I choose this as one. I have to be careful, so I have enough space for 10. So this is one. Three. Three. Okay, so I go up. This is three. How many observations? Uh, 
you know, the, sorry, the cumulative frequency in the third class? Seven. Seven, yeah. So all of the observations up to the third class combined is seven. And the total cumulative frequency by the, in the, when we reach to the last class is? Ten. Ten. Okay. So notice that um, this is not really, uh, this is just a dashed line. Shouldn't be misleading. Okay. So what we have right now, I write it in black. This is less than cumulative frequency, less than cumulative frequency histogram. And if I want to present relative less than cumulative frequency histogram, what should I do? The height of the columns would be the same proportion, right? So is there yeah. an easy way? Add a vertical axis on the right side. Very good. Thank you. So I simply add a new axis on the right side. The height of the columns, the proportion of the heights of the column would be the same thing, but the meaning of this height would be, just look at the column and tell me from the table, what is the, this is now the relative, uh, less than cumulative frequency. Um, Can you please tell me what is the 0 0.1 point 0.1 the meaning of this height would be point 0.3 3 and the meaning of this point height point 0.7 seven. Seven, and the meaning of this height would be 1 1 so how many charts do you see on the screen right now two two uh, the same Histogram, if you use it with the left side, would be less than cumulative frequency histogram. And we, if you use the right axis, then it would be relative less than cumulative frequency histogram. Now, we also may be interested in um, less than cumulative frequency polygon. And again, this is exception. Please take note for polygon for cumulative frequency polygon, or either less than or more than. We have to use the beginning of the first class and the end of the classes. So the polygon goes like this. Uh, maybe I write it. This is the beginning of the first class and end of the classes. Now I have my polygon. And if I use this polygon, uh, so did you take note for cumulative frequency polygon, we start from the beginning of the first class and we connect end of the classes. Now maybe I show you if it was, if it was more than cumulative polygon, it would end up to be something like this. And I would draw the beginning of the first class connected to the... Notice that in both cases, we have this um, one end of the histogram uh, or polygon ends up to be at the high side. It, never, it doesn't come down because it is monotonic. Once it starts to go up, it always goes up. Uh, some of you may be tempted. I show the temptation, then I erase it you may be tempted to touch the ground. Don't be tempted. It is cumulative. It ends up at that high end. Okay? It ends up that high. And now, if I use this blue polygon with the left side, then I have uh, less than cumulative frequency polygon. And if I use it with the right side, then I have relative less than 
cumulative frequency polygon. So how many charts do you see here? Four. 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 Good. Okay. So uh, we talked about less than cumulative frequency, more than cumulative frequency. Yeah, so your uh, next task is that I leave it to you. You have to do it and show it to me. Um, okay, maybe read it for me first. Read the more than cumulative frequencies, please. And Okay, so this is the Nine, seven, and three. Three. And the relative more than cumulative frequency? Uh, one. one. Two point nine. Two point seven. Point three. Point three. Now I want you to show me um, his, uh, the uh, more than cumulative frequency histogram and relative more than cumulative frequency histogram and polygons. So we're gonna start off with our chart labeling our x-axis and y-axis. Yeah, x-axis uh, classes are the same thing. So they yeah, will start five, from- 10, 15, 20. And, and on y-axis we will have Frequency, okay? Yes. So uh, the y-axis, uh, the first number is going to be 10. So the first column, it's more than. So of course, all of the observations are more than the first column. So this is 10. Second column is nine. So this is nine. Next one. Seven. Nice. And three. So this is more than cumulative frequency histogram, okay? Uh, now, if I want to have relative more than frequency histogram, what should I do? On the right side, create a new axis. Thank you. And that is relative more than cumulative frequency. So what would be the meaning of this first column? That would be if one. I use one, this one, zero point nine, point seven, and zero point three. So, how many charts do we have so far? Two. Two. Now, if I want to have the polygon, what should I do? Start with your the start beginning. The yeah, the, the beginning of the first class. Yeah, the beginning of the first class and go to the end of the first class. No, no, to the big, like in the, in the next class. Less than, yes, it's the reverse of the less than. Okay. So we go to the beginning. So it is beginning, 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 beginning. So the only point is that we don't use the midpoints and we end at the end of the last class. It's a monotonic polygon that is always going down. And if we use this polygon with the left axis, then we will have more than cumulative frequency polygon. And if I use the same polygon with the right axis, then I have relative more than cumulative frequency, polygon. And how many charts do we see here? Four. 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 Um, can I ask a question? Of course. Oh yeah, um, no, number 53, 
Uh, and, uh, yeah, no, 53. And for the interval, like you say, 2.2 on the solution, but you said for the simplicity, we have to make it 0.5 or like just... Okay, or just how about we do it? How about we do it? 53, okay? Question 53. And um, first we start to the power. It doesn't k a lot of time. It should be greater than n. Tell, tell me how many observations are there? Um, there are like six classes. I didn't ask you the classes. I want how many oh. observations are there? Uh, how many? Um, um, 36. So 36. We want 2 to the power of k to be 36. 2 to the power of 1 is not. 2 to the power of 2 is not. 2 to the power of 3 is not. 2 to the power of 4 is 16 is not. 2 to the power of 5 is 32 is not. Therefore, k is 6. The interval. Interval should be greater. What is the maximum? Um, maximum is 15. 15. Uh, and minimum is, is 3. 3. Um, number of classes is 6. Therefore, I should be greater than 12 divided by 6. Uh, therefore, I should be greater than or equal to 2. Yeah. I mean, so, that was your question, right? Yeah, but like, so, I now, uh, uh, yeah. listen to me, listen. Yeah. Will you choose two? Yep. No. Sorry. Okay. Just take a note. If okay. Also, if you remember the note that you took from the class, we never yeah. choose two because it will create difficulty for the last class. So we will okay. choose something more than two. Yeah. Um, can I choose 2.1? Um, no, I don't think so. Yes, you can. Oh, you can okay. use 2.1. Okay. Okay, can I choose 2.2? Uh, I guess, yeah. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Uh, I can also choose four. Oh. But if you choose four, then your last class will be empty and you lose mark. So don't oh. go too high. Don't create a bunch of empty classes at the end. Okay. So just 2.1, choose 2.2. Um, yeah, if you like it, yeah, like if you are a beauty lover, if you choose 2.5, your classes would be more, more beautiful. Uh, just make sure that if you go to 2.5, make sure that your last class is not empty. If you chose 2.5 and you ended up having a, an empty class, just roll back. Go back to 2.1 or 2.3 such that your last class doesn't become empty. You have flexibility in this case. Wise flexibility. And you said Y2 cannot become the interval. Like, can you repeat it? Like, I couldn't understand. Yeah. If you choose two, yeah. then you form your classes. Uh, for example, you will start from three to five, five to seven, seven to nine, nine to 11, and 11 to 13, uh, and 13 to 15. Is that right? Yeah, right. Six classes. Do yeah. I have liberty to change this six? No. No. Oh, yeah, and, now, so. and I followed your suggestion to choose two. Oh, yeah. Then 15 will be excluded in the rest. Yeah. Now, then yeah. the difficulty yeah. is this. There is an observation 15. Where do okay. you want to put that? These yeah. are all two under. Yeah. Two under. So this is two under. And 15, okay. we'll end up having no classes. Okay. So be wise and choose 2.1, which satisfies the formula. Okay. 